Gospels to 1 Samuel chapter 1. It's on your pew Bible on page 225. 1 Samuel chapter 1. Hear now the reading of God's holy and inerrant word. There is a certain man of Ramathiam, Zophim, of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jer- Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf, an Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion, because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And a rival used to provoke her grievously, to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah went up and would not eat. Therefore Hannah went and would not eat. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you not weep? Why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She vowed a vow to the Lord and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me, and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah, and Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. In due time Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. The man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she she said to her husband, As soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him, so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, She took him up with her, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli. And she said, O my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who was standing here in your presence, praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. This is the word of God. Well, we are continuing our venture into 1 Samuel, and as you can see, we're continuing in 1 Samuel chapter 1. There is so much here for us to consider. A few weeks ago, when we started looking at 1 Samuel 1, we discovered in this chapter there was surrounding Hannah, and in Hannah's life, deep darkness. There was the decay of the nation that we took, talked about, the decay of the priesthood. There was Hannah's own bareness of her womb. There was also her tormentor. And all these things we saw had great effect, as the, the passage elaborates with so many terms, which is uncommon for Hebrew. 
of the effect this had on Hannah's life. We saw her at the end of her rope, as it were, turning to the Lord and crying out to them and there, to him. And there's this wonderful picture of what prayer should look like. And we could have even a whole sermon on what that looks like, uh, how it's described here of pouring out our souls before the Lord. But we noticed above all that the sovereign Lord to whom she prayed has this pattern that Hannah was counting on. A pattern that when everything in life seems to be at its darkest point, it's just then that the Lord loves to shine through with the brilliant light of the gospel. Tonight we are again back in the same chapter, focusing though instead tonight on Hannah's response of how she responds to this gift from the Lord of Samuel. We'll see that she's a model for us of covenantal response to God's covenant blessings in our lives. How should we respond? What should we do? Well, what does she do? She is a model for us. And so we turn here to see that, but we will also conclude our time looking at how the Lord responds to Hannah's response. And so let's begin our time tonight focusing on our first point, remembering. We must remember. Remember the good gifts that are from the Lord. This is our first point tonight. We must remember our good gifts that come from the Lord. Certainly Hannah remembered the words of Eli as she left the house of the Lord. They would have been filling her mind as Eli had just pronounced this benediction over her. She's going back to the tent with her co-wife where she has been so tormented. And yet we read in verses 17 and 18, the woman went away and ate and her face was no longer sad. Why? Because Eli's words, this benediction had been pronounced over her of God's intention to bless her. The priest had announced the word and so she left joyful. It's actually, we could also focus on those verses and how it's a great response of faith example of faith uh, in light of God's word. We could also focus on the benediction. I'll just mention this in passing because I do think it is important for us to think about our worship service. At the end of the worship service, every Sunday morning and evening, we have a benediction. Well, look at how Hannah responds to that benediction. We should be aware that the same thing is going on. We're receiving a benediction from the Lord. But then, back in our verses here, we see later in verse 19, we read that Elkanah, in fact, knew his wife, and she conceived as the Lord remembered her. But it's just now that we have to ask the question, would Hannah remember the Lord? Would she remember the Lord? For we all know how common it is in our own lives that when someone gives us a gift, we often become so focused on the gift that we lose sight of the giver. So would Hannah here remember the Lord? This happens daily, or maybe not daily, but frequently in our house where Maybe my wife prepares dinner and I fail to give her thanks for what she's done. I'm focused on the food in front of me. I think we can all think of the example of a little child at Christmas. I remember the two most uh, uh, exciting, from a worldly perspective, Christmases that I ever had. I ran down the stairs and I got every single present that I had asked for that year. It was incredible. I opened every single one, was elated to see that I got the zip line I wanted. I got everything. It was great. But my mom had to continually say, thank your grandmother, thank your aunt, thank your dad, thank, thank, thank. And I probably didn't even really listen to her. And as soon as I had opened up my presents, I was so focused on them, I'd dart out the door to start playing with them, probably running right past grandparents with open arms. I ignored those who had given me these great gifts. This is what we're like once we have a, a gift that we receive. We can become focused on it. This is true for us spiritually as well. We might pray and pray and pray for God to do something in our life or to give us something that we have sense that we need. But as soon as we get it, we often forget all about the Lord. The gift of God's grace that he's lovingly placed into our hands, we begin to focus on it. It consumes our gaze. And we forget all about God and his grace. And sadly, while sometimes we fail to remember our earthly friends, our, our family or others who give to us different gifts, we forget them. At times, far more frequently, do we forget the Lord. Do we forget how he has given us different gifts in our life. And so, we are too often like those nine lepers that come to Jesus in the Gospels. Remember, ten come to Jesus and ask him. They're actually outside of a city as Jesus enters into it. And they say, Lord, Master, have mercy on us. And Jesus turns to them. He shows mercy to them. He responds to them. He says, go to the temple and present yourself to the priest. And as 
they go. They're actually healed. Well, nine continue to march on, but one of them remembers, remembers that this was the Lord Jesus Christ, and they, he turns back around, comes and falls down on his face because he remembered what the Lord had done to him, for him. Friends, we are so frequently like the nine, forgetting to remember the Lord, focused on the gift before us, focused on the cleansing of our leprosy, or whatever the case may be. And this is compounded all the more when we remember James chapter 1, that every good and perfect gift, every good thing we have in our lives, it comes from above. And every single one of those things we should remember the Lord for. And that's exactly what Hannah does in our passage. We see it here. We see in verse 20, as she names Samuel, she remembers that this child has come from the Lord. And so the name Samuel indicates that this was one who was given from the Lord to, to, uh, to Hannah. And we see her memory also kicking in in verse 26 as she actually comes back to present Samuel into the house of the Lord. And if you look closely at the verses there, she gives some detail of her experience. That must have been two or three years before, for it was two or three years before a child was weaned. She remembers the gifts that God has given from the Lord. She remembers that they are from the Lord. And you and I, too, are to remember our covenant God amidst all the wonderful provisions he gives to us in our lives. Scripture is actually filled with a multitude of commandments that you and I need to remember the Lord. It's an incredibly important commandment for us spiritually that we are actually to engage our minds, to actually think through the different gifts that we receive from God. It's to be a cognitive focus, something that we intentionally use our minds to do. We are to have a clear, intentional, definite calling to mind and awareness of what the Lord has graciously given to us. And so we are to remember, like Hannah, we are to remember that these good gifts come from the Lord. This leads us to our second point. We are first to remember that our good gifts are from the Lord. We are secondly to devote those good gifts to God. We are to give them back to him. This is what Hannah teaches us in our passage. She receives the gift and then she gives it back to the Lord, devoting it to him. In verse 11, she begins it all by vowing that if the Lord of hosts will indeed look on my affliction and remember, uh, remember me and not forget her, his servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. And then in verse 24 and following, we see that her act- she actually follows through with this vow, taking him up to the Lord's house, and as we read in our translations, lending him to the Lord. It's actually a word play on, um, uh, it's a word play in the Hebrew, but here we can just gloss it and say it's devoting him to the Lord. Hannah devoted Samuel to the Lord, and we too are to devote our gifts to the Lord. But let's take a closer look at what that means here for Hannah in the life of Samuel. The first thing we see, as I just mentioned, is verse 26. She lends or devotes him to the Lord. She's literally brought this child up to the courts or the house of the Lord and left him there. While he could have been back at home helping her uh, around the house, maybe taking care of a field, preparing a meal, or just been there for her to lay her hands around his neck and give him a kiss or a hug, she leaves him in the presence of the Lord. She gives her son to the Lord to be about his work, for his glory, to be engaged in his business. At heart, then, our devotion to the Lord is giving something to him to be engaged in his kingdom work, to be made use of by the Lord as he sees fit, to be devoted to his glory. And that's what devotion is to be like for you, Christian. You are to give whatever gifts God has given you back to the Lord, holding it in your hands and saying, Lord, I offer this to you. It's yours. And so while Hannah took a literal journey there Uh, from her hometown to Shiloh, we too, through faith and prayer, are to bring the gifts that God gives us to the Lord, present present them spiritually to our gracious God. And so, this is our first principle we learn about devotion, that the gifts that God gives to you are to be presented by you to him for his glory and for his purposes. But note too that the devotion that's encouraged is an ongoing a never-ending devotion. In verse 11, how long is Samuel said to be devoted or given over to the Lord? Is it just when they come up to worship at the house in Shiloh? Just that one time a year that Samuel is devoted. 
Or is it just maybe a few months out of the year? Or maybe just a few years in his young life when he's a child, and then we get him back? No, in verse 11, I will give him to the Lord all of his days. Again, in verse 28, we read, as long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. And then I think most poetically in verse 22, Hannah says, I will bring him so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. I think what might be in view in Hannah's words there, that he would dwell there forever, excuse me, was, uh, is that uh, we, we think of the Old Testament saints, I've mentioned this before, it's not really having a great grasp of what God was doing, of eternal life, of the gospel, and of salvation. But if you look, as we will next time, to chapter 2, you see Hannah gets the gospel. She gets what God is doing. When she gets this child Samuel, as we'll see, she responds with exalted praise of the Lord, recognizing how wonderful these things he has done. And so she realizes, I am devoting my son to the Lord. He's going to be in his house, but even when he dies from this earth, he will continue, not in this earthly house of the Lord, but he will continue into the eternal house of the Lord. He will be in God's presence forever. I'm not sure if that's what's going on, but my main point here is, that this devotion is ongoing. It does not stop. It is continual. And perhaps here there's a challenge for all of us. At times we get different gifts in our life and we think, well, we'll devote it to the Lord when we feel spiritually energized. Maybe Pastor Randy has preached an incredibly encouraging sermon and so you feel that that sense of passion and zeal to serve the Lord. And at that point you think, okay, I can devote myself or this gift or whatever it is to the Lord. But that's not what's going on here. It's not dependent on how Hannah feels. It's at all times that the Christian is to be devoted and they are to devote their gifts. Don't allow yourself to be contented with a previous devotion. Maybe for others of us here, there are many gray-haired saints here this evening. Perhaps for others of us here, you've been laboring for a long time for the Lord, serving him with all of your heart. You've seen other friends who maybe have fallen away from the faith, kick their faith to the curb, And you need to hear, this is exactly what God is looking for. You have not made a mistake. You are serving the Lord. You are devoted to him, and you have been for a long time. And so do not give up. Continue pressing on in the faith. So devotion is never ending. And this brings us to a third point that we learn about devotion here. What gifts exactly are we to devote back to the Lord? What can we bring and present to our God and devote to him? Well, notice that Hannah is devoting Samuel. That's pretty obvious, isn't it? Devoting Samuel, this child she's longed for intensely for a long period of time. Remember the bitterness of her soul. All those words that we just read through the scriptures that describe this deep darkness that has affected her, that has come into her life, that is plaguing her. Remember the tormenting of Penina, the loud weeping, all that she has experienced. All of it was over the fact that she did not have a child, that her womb was barren the lack of a child was clearly her greatest felt need in the world the greatest trouble that she had and so the gift of this child would have been her most prized possession but here we find her devoting that child back to the lord and imagine what it have been like to actually take this journey to shiloh she's finally received the blessing but then she's weaned him and it's time for him to be devoted imagine being hannah having that long trip every step you take is a step closer to when you're going to give your child a hug and leave him there in the presence of Eli. Every step, you get closer to leaving your son who you love and adored and have asked for. You'll only get to see him probably one time a year. She may, um, she may have, uh, she probably on the journey there would have tried to hug her little child as often as possible. He would have been a toddler at this age, and we know toddlers don't like to sit still, but as frequently as she could. She would gather up this little child in her arms and just love on him, show him affection, and think about how this isn't going to be able, we're not going to be able to do this next week. This isn't going to happen as regularly as it has been over the past two or three years. Then after leaving him there, there certainly would be countless times, probably daily, that she would think back to her son and just wish she could give him a kiss, talk to him, and uh, uh, love on him. Imagine being in that situation if you have children with your own child. What would it be like to take your own child and leave them in the presence of the Lord for a long period of time, not be able to see them until maybe a year later? Imagine what that would feel like. But no matter how much she loved this child, 
she was going to devote him to the Lord. And this, again, is a model for us, a covenantal model of covenantal response and covenantal devotion for us to take what's most important in our lives and give it back to the Lord and say, this is yours. It's yours, Lord. You may have it. And surely if the most important gifts in our lives are to be devoted to God, then all smaller gifts are to be devoted as well. Yes, Samuel had a particular way he was devoted. He was left in the temple courts, and yet it's no less true that every gift in Hannah's life was to be given to God in its own particular way. James, as I mentioned earlier, reminds us that every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming from the Father of heavenly lights. And there's not one of these gifts in our lives that is not to be devoted to the Lord. All of it is to the Lord, for the Lord. And we should say, for your Lord, O Lord, for your Lord, O God, for your glory, we submit it to you. It is yours for you to do as you please and as you see best. And so what do you have to devote to the Lord? What is it in our lives? What can we practically think through? Well, it's everything, isn't it? All that we have, our time is to be devoted to the Lord. We've all heard of devotional times, how we are to have a quiet or devotional time every single day. That's a very good thing. It's a great practice of exposing ourselves to the means of grace so we can pray, so that we can hear from God in his word, be nourished by that. And we should not just pray and read the word at one time. We're to meditate day and night. But even those moments where you're not self-consciously thinking about something you read in the Bible earlier in the day, it is all to be devotional time, is it not? Every moment of your day is a gift from the Lord and is all to be devoted to him. And what about your work? Still to this day, I remember in college, one of the most um, landmark times for me was a period of time when someone had encouraged me to memorize Paul's words, whether you eat or whether you drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And I had put off writing a paper until the evening before it was due. It was my big class project. And I remember saying, you know what? This means I should do this paper to the glory of the Lord. I've never thought about doing my schoolwork to the glory of God. I had just been changing the recent years. And I thought, I'm going to strive with all my might to do this to the glory of God. And so I did. And I can say with joy that that was one of the best times in my life. It was one of those markers that I will always remember. I can actually do these secular things to God. It's not just being in church. It's not just fellowshipping with my friends. My work can be devoted to the Lord. And step back and think about it further. Who gave you work? Who is it who created work for you to do? You think work is my work. That's where I do this or that or the other, but not for the Lord. But even your work, you can devote to the Lord. And we could uh, devote our finances to the Lord. We could talk about that and how we are to be giving 10%, but is not the 90% left over in your pocket still the Lord's? Is that not for his disposal, for his use? Yes, you can use it for yourself. You're supposed to, of course, But even as you use it for yourself, you're supposed to be mindful. This is still the Lord's. I still devote this to you. Still given over for your purposes. Devote your relationships with people. Devote your conversations with people. Devote them all to the Lord. And yes, devote your children to the Lord. doesn't matter how old they are. Say, Lord, they are yours for you to do with them as you please. Particularly if we have children in the home. Can think of Deuteronomy 6 that tells us to speak of the word, to speak of the Lord and of his word when we wake up and when we lie down, when we go by the way outside and when we are at the table. That means at all times you are to be speaking of the word of the Lord to your children. There should not be one day in our lives. I mean, that's pretty pervasive, but there should not be one day in our lives where with our children, particularly when they are at our home, We should not be speaking to them the word of the Lord. And then we should be praying for them, praying to the Lord of hosts, the sovereign God that we saw Hannah praying to, praying for our children, for their salvation, for them to grow up into these rich covenantal blessings that God has given us. And then we should be praying with them every single day. Devote your children to the Lord. We could go on and on, but maybe the best summary for us would be Romans 12, 1 through 2, where Paul says, Offer yourselves as living sacrifices telling us it's not just this thing or that thing it's not just your time your money or anything else offer yourself all of you to the lord devote yourself to him and so we could summarize what we should respond to the lord by saying i 
and all that I have, I am here for your purposes, for your causes, for your pleasure, for your glory, and I am at your disposal for your use. Here I am, Lord. Send me. This is the Christian's devotion. This is what you are to be doing on a daily basis. Devote yourself to the Lord. But before we move on, we need to note that the Christian's devotion is not just some dreary, dry, difficult, um, unexciting thing for the Christian. That's not what Christian devotion is in Scripture. Christian devotion is also, it is, yes, our responsibility, but it is also the Christian's deep longing and joy. How is that? Well, as we read through Scripture, it's clear that we can only devote ourselves and all that we have to the Lord our God because He has first devoted us to Himself. You have already been devoted to God by God Himself. We read in Ephesians 5 about our devotion to God, specifically Christ. We read Paul saying, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her, that He might sanctify her. That is, that Christ might sanctify, or as Sinclair Ferguson has recently made the point in a book that Randy has recently mentioned from this pulpit, devoted to God, sanctifying being the same thing as devoting, that Christ might devote the church to God, might devote the church to God, having cleansed her with the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor. There are deep gospel mysteries here in this passage. Paul tells us that Christ gave himself up for the church, that he presented himself, even devoted himself to God's wrath, as we spoke of this morning, so that we could in turn be devoted. And devoted to whom? To God, to the living and the true God. And under what conditions? That we might be presented to God in great splendor, for God is a God of splendor, and we are to come back and reflect his, his splendor. And so the whole purpose of our salvation is that we are to be devoted to God. And what good news is that for us? Consider this. There is no one else that you would long to be devoted for, is there? Would you rather be devoted to the other things in life? For we are always devoted to something. We're always devoted to something. And apart from Christ, we're devoted to all sorts of things in this world. Would you rather be devoted to the resume that seems to always read, the one who never quite made it? Or devote yourself to the job, which always tells us there's more to be done. Would you like to devote yourself to the friend who tells you you've never quite lived up? What about devoting yourself to all other things in this world that will always tell you in some way you lack? This devotion is the devotion that Satan introduced for, to us in Genesis chapter 3 as he comes into the garden and he introduces us to the kingdom of self. A kingdom that if we had time to, to uh, develop further is a kingdom because it's not devoted to God of filth of corruption, of the kingdom of squalor. But now he has redeemed us from that so that in glorious splendor we can in turn devote ourselves back to God. And you have to ask yourself again here, what else could you possibly want it to be devoted to? Would you not want to be devoted to God? For when you are devoted to God, as we see in verse 22, you are actually in his presence. Hannah is hinting at this in verse 22 when she says, I will bring him to the house of the Lord so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. As she devotes Samuel, he will be in his presence. And when you are devoted to the Lord, to the Lord that's the one before whom you appear at all times. And where would you rather be than in the presence of the living and the true God? When you are devoted to him, that is the one you are before, standing before him saying, here I am, send me. You're in his presence where else would you rather be than the one of whom Scripture testifies at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. That's where Hannah is leaving her child in the presence of this God, the living, the true God. We're reminded in Psalm 84 that it is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a lowly doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Friends, as we'll sing in a moment, how sweet and awesome is the place with Christ within the doors, while everlasting love displays the choicest of her stores. That's what we get when we are devoted to God. We get the everlasting stores of Christ and of God's love. That's where Samuel finds himself. That's where we find ourselves when we devote ourselves and all that we have back to the Lord. And so through Christ's work, through his first devoting us, we too can devote 
ourselves back to God. And that brings us to our final point. Unfortunately, I could not think of a very brief and succinct way to point, put this last point. But the Lord responds marvelously, wonderfully, in ways that Hannah could not imagine to her devotion. We see that Hannah has devoted this young child, again, probably age two to three, to the Lord. She's brought him to him, saying he's here for all of his days. It's never ending. Uh, use him as you see fit. And while Hannah knew that Samuel would be used for the glory of the Lord, she could have never had a clue of how exactly this would be. You see, this little child Samuel would not just go on to be any servant in God's kingdom or in his house. No, as we read through the following pages of this book, as we read through what goes on in Samuel's life, we see him being given this most wonderful and amazing task, once again, that Hannah could have never conceived of. It's the child of 1 Samuel 1 who has been tasked with this special task of establishing a throne amidst God's people. Establishing a throne amidst God's people. And it's not just any throne. This is the throne that, yes, King Saul first sits on, and we'll get to that eventually. But it's also the throne of King David, the one who we read the Psalms, we see this man's great spiritual devotion. We read how faithful he was to fulfill the covenant, to wipe out the Canaanites who had not uh, yet been eradicated from the land. I so faithful in so many different ways to God's covenant. And yet we also know that David sins and falls far short of the glory of God just as we do. You see, Samuel was involved with establishing the throne, not just of any king, not even of David or any of his descendants in general, but specifically of establishing the throne, setting it up in the midst of Israel by God, of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the one who would sit on his throne for eternity to rule in grace for the sake of his people. That's what happened in response to Hannah's devotion of Samuel to the Lord. The Lord took Samuel. The Lord used this devoted child from the womb of a barren woman who had asked for him and had devoted him back to him. He used Samuel to establish the throne of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We find here a gospel encouragement for us, for that's what we know happens in our lives when we devote ourselves, our time, whatever it is, to the Lord. Know that in some way, somehow, when we say, here I am, send me, that the Lord will use that for the sake of exalting the Lord Jesus Christ, for the sake of establishing his kingdom, his reign, either in our lives or in the lives of others. And so, Christian, what greater reason do you need to devote yourself to the Lord than that consideration, that good news of God's grace to take what we offer back in response to his grace to him and make it a part of his kingdom? What good news? Well, there may be some here tonight who realize they have never devoted themselves to the Lord who realize I've never actually said to God, I give myself wholly and completely to you. I am yours. Here I am, send, send me. This passage is an encouragement to all of us, calling to any who might be here who find themselves in that position. We can do so just as Hannah did and find God's grace and mercy that he has in fact, when you come to him through faith, already devoted you. And then you in turn can become a part of his kingdom as you devote yourself to the Lord. What greater privilege will there be on that day when we stand before the throne of Christ and we hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. All because in light of his grace, in light of the gospel, in light of what Christ has done, he responded, here I am, send me. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we do come before you tonight to devote ourselves to you. Oh God, you have redeemed us by the blood of Christ. Father, you have sent forth your Son, and he is a great and a matchless King who has accomplished the task of our salvation. But in response to the gospel, Lord, we devote ourselves back to you. We say, here we are, send us. Father, we do so not only as individuals, but we also do so for this church. We pray and ask that you, O oh God, who hear our prayers, who are listening now to the pleas of your people, we pray, O oh God, that you would indeed cause us to be devoted to you, that you would receive this church's devotion. Use us in this community. Stir us up to love and good works. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.